Yet, how do we understand whether corridors work, have an effect on um, species dispersal across entire communities? And so that's where we focused our efforts more recently. And the way we've done this is to start with a new um, technique, which is to add um, heavy isotopes of nitrogen into the center fragment. We do this by spraying the nitrogen on plants. It's quickly absorbed into plant tissues, taken up into um, fruits and seeds, and then also um, herbivore consumers take up the heavy isotope of nitrogen in their tissues as well. And so we can then track the movement of organisms through this heavy isotope as they move through the landscape. What this um, procedure does is allow us to solve a needle in a haystack problem. How do you understand dispersal, for example, of wind dispersed seeds or um, very abundant insects when just a fraction of individuals are dispersing and you have to track the movement across hundreds, thousands, many thousands of individuals? And so I'll tell you about how we solve the needle in the haystack problem um, in a minute. But first I have to tell you that we initially have to collect those seeds. And so the way we do it is by setting up um, uh, seed traps that are 10 feet high, they're about a meter wide. And so this is a group of uh, technicians that were setting up one of these traps, but we didn't just set up one or a few. We set up 4,400 seed traps across the landscapes. So this is the view into one fragment. And then this, of course, leads us with the problem that we collect many seeds and then we have to sort the seeds and process the seeds <laughs> and sample the seeds. The um, analysis of 15N has the advantage that we can, once we've at least sorted the seeds, we can analyze many hundreds at one time in one sample and then use statistical models to determine what fraction of those seeds have been dispersed. Now, I, I'm going to tell you about plants now, not insects, because we've analyzed the uh, heavy isotope of nitrogen in the plants, but not the insects yet. Those are next in the queue. But I want to tell you that this has enabled us to shift our focus. We've looked at um, dispersal of bird dispersed plants. There are fewer of those, and we have marking techniques visual marking techniques that we can use to track bird dispersed plants. Um, this has allowed us to get more heavily into wind dispersed plants as well. And what I want to tell you is that there is reason to believe that our corridors can have strong effects on wind dispersed plants. So this is thanks to work that was led by my collaborator Ellen Damption. And I'm not going to go into the details of that work except to tell you that as you probably know from walking down the street today <laughs> through the wind that corridors can have a funneling effect and they actually have three effects that affect plant dispersal in our landscape. They redirect wind, so they tend to take wind coming in different directions oriented down the corridor. They accelerate the wind movement and the wind is more turbulent in the corridors prompting more seed release and seed dispersal. And so there's reason to believe that our corridors create physical conditions that might promote seed dispersal. Okay, and so then the other thing I want to tell you before showing you results is that this is an, also causes us to rethink what is our standard for effects of corridors. We've always compared movement, for example, between connected fragments and unconnected fragments. But what we've never known is how much does, uh, how much do corridors get us to the standard of dispersal in unfragmented landscapes. And so what we've done is created a, um, ex experimental uh, context where we compare movement. This green area is, um, is uh, sprayed with heavy isotopes of nitrogen. We have seed traps going down the corridor and into the connected fragment. And then we compare that to dispersal in large relatively unfragmented landscapes where we spray one area and then track movement going out in radii from the, the sprayed, <coughs> sprayed section. 
And so then that leads to telling you results. And I'm just going to show you for two species. I could show you for a few more, and we're, we have more in the queue. So this is just hot off the presses. And what I'm um, showing you here is a dispersal kernel. So it's a measure of probability density of dispersal going out from near the um, spray area, that would be zero. But then going out, we actually started collecting seeds at five meters from the sprayed area, going out to 200 meters, which is the longest distance we can get in our connected fragments. And there's two points I'd like to make from this graphic. Um, one is that we do find some dispersal of these wind dispersed species at long distances. Um, and so there is evidence, and I should tell you that this comes from data on approaching 10,000 seeds and where maybe 1% or a little bit fewer than of them are marked, are actually marked. But there is evidence of long distance dispersal going out the furthest distances we measure. And then for these wind dispersed species, there's two ways to look at the same result. The result is that there's no statistical difference between these dispersal kernels. And so the um, way to look at it is, well, there's no difference, but the Truth of the matter is that's a good thing in the sense of restoring dispersal relative to the rate we like to see um, in connected landscapes relative to unconnected or unfragmented landscapes. Now, this actually contrasts with a different result for one of the bird dispersed species we looked at. Um, this is uh, uh, wing sumac. And here, what we found is that there are differences. And there are differences in that there's actually more movement between connected fragments than what we find in large unfragmented landscapes. In this case, corridors seem to be funneling birds and increasing the rate of dispersal um, between our source and target areas. Um, I should tell you that I put a contrast here of wind dispersed versus bird dispersed species. The other wind dispersed species we've looked at have a similar pattern. The bird dispersed species actually go in two directions. Um, one is this pattern where there's more dispersal to connected fragments. And the other, but there's less dispersal. And that's because birds seem to be exhibiting two different behaviors. One is to hang around the fragment where they're collecting the seeds, using the trees around the edges of those perches. Or if they're moving, they're funneling down to the next connected fragment. So then what they've chosen to do when they're getting those seeds affects the effective corridors on dispersal. <coughs> and then I lastly wanted to connect these results, especially for wind dispersed species, to what we observe at the level of communities. And so what I want to show you is one attempt to connect when to um, species diversity. And so this is, again, from uh, Alan Damson's work published last year, where she, um, we, we developed a measure of the wind speed aligned along the corridor, that's on the x-axis, and then related that to the species richness. And what we find is that more wind blowing along in the direction of the corridor seems to be related to the number of species we find in connected fragments. And so linking this mechanism of increased um, dispersal of wind dispersed species through corridors to potential consequences for plant communities. Now I want to shift gears just a little bit <coughs> to another kind of question we've been able to address more recently. I focus so far on what in conservation might be viewed as the positive effects of corridors, that is, their effects on increasing dispersal through the landscape, their effects on increasing the diversity of species. And yet, in conservation and creation of corridors, uh, conservationists worry that these same corridors that we're creating for conservation benefit might cause harm by promoting the movement of species or processes through the landscape that we don't want in conservation. And so, in the last year, my group has asked the question through a review. Do corridors have unintended negative effects 
do they promote the movement of antagonistic species, especially predators, parasites, disease that have harmful effects on the organisms we're trying to conserve? Do they have effects in creating a negative, <coughs> negative edge effects? Do they increase the invasion of uh, plants or animals? Do they increase the spread of disturbance that is unwanted in the landscape? And I'm not going to tell you the results of this review except to say, for the most part, um, we don't have to worry about the negative effects. They're far away by the positive effects of corridors on dispersal and diversity and other measures. Uh, but I do want to focus in on two results from our corridor experiment. One comes back to the issue of plant diversity. And what I've done is taken um, the full data set that I showed you previously and now extracted just the species of restoration interest in longleaf pine savanna. And so here, in the gray bars, we see the pat a pattern that's similar to the overall pattern. More species found in connected relative to unconnected fragments. But now if I do the same thing but consider not the native species of restoration interest, but consider invasive species, we see no pattern. That is, corridors don't seem to be spreading invasive plants through the landscape. And, and I should say this is invasive and exotic species, so non-invasive exotics. And the point here is that um, plants are either relatively immobile, they stay where they've been planted historically, or they're so good at dispersal that they don't need corridors to get around the landscape. Now, that last point brings me to an interesting, more recent example from our landscapes that, um, that are an exception, but in my view, an exception that also proves the rule. And this is work done by a former graduate student in, in the um, project named Julian Masasco, and he studied the invasive fire ant. Now, what I learned about fire ants once Julian started his study is that there are two forms of fire ants. The two forms are one that has one queen per colony, and then a second form has multiple queens per colony. So these are monogyne or polygyne colonies of fire ants. Now this distinction matters not just in the number of queens in the colonies, it matters to their dispersal. Monogyne fire ants that have one queen per colony, they mate in mating flights hundred or hundreds of meters in the air, and they settle down to the earth to form a new colony, they're not going to use a corridor to get through the landscape. Polygyne colonies um, <coughs> spread through essentially walking. They're moving short distances as individuals spread slowly through the landscape. So the point being, for the same species, there's big differences in how they disperse through the landscape. And there's also differences in the effects that these ants have. And so, <clears throat> um, Julian measured the density of fire ants in um, connected and unconnected patches. And that, by the way, I should tell you, this is the luck of how the experiment worked. Um, we weren't able to introduce different kinds of fire ants into our landscape. We wouldn't have wanted to. But it just so happened that half of our experimental blocks had one form of fire ant, half had the other. So it created the perfect experimental context, context to test the effects of fire ants. Where there were monogyne, single queen per colony fire ants, there's no effect on the abundance of, of corridors on the abundance of fire ants. But where there are multiple queens per colony, there are um, about 30% more fire ants per fragment where there are multiple queens per colony. And then where there's more abundant fire ants, there's an effect on the diversity of other ant species. And where there's one queen per colony, there's no effect on ant diversity. Where there's multiple queens per colony, there's about 25% um, fewer ant species in connected patches. So this seems to link together the story that where uh, invasive species are dispersal limited, corridors can potentially affect their movement and then have negative consequences that ripple through the community. 
what I want to do in just a few slides is um, step back from the experiment to thinking about larger scales. So our experiments on the scale of hectares are large for ecology, but they're small compared to the scale of management across the rest of the world. And there are many ways I could approach this question, but what I want to do is step back to multiple fragmentation experiments and ask what are the consequences of fragmentation for the long term if we look across the fragmentation experiment. And so what I'm doing here is assembling, and did this with Andy and others, the data sets that have been accumulated over decades. Uh, so maybe the most famous one is the Biological Dynamics of Forest Fragments project in Brazil. But there are five others, and I was happy with this slide that Andy and I appear to be the youngest of the, of the group. Um, but there are long-running experiments where we can learn a lot about the effects of fragmentation over decades. And so I'm just going to show you two results. Um, and this is a paper coming out next week. So first, I'll show you what we've learned about the effects of habitat isolation or its inverse corridors. And so what I'm showing is on the x-axis now an effect size where um, a negative value means lower in fragments that are not connected than fragments that are connected. Um, and I'm showing you here something that I've already summarized just with the results of my study in the talk, that it decreases the movement between fragments. But what I can do is put up the effects of habitat isolation um, understood over many studies and over many ecological <coughs> processes that are affected by loss of connectivity. And what we see, whether it's on movement, um, abundance, species persistence, or it's inverse is greater extinction, the number of species, metrics of um, ecosystem function and pollination, po pollination, that there are consistently degrading effects of losing connectivity across communities and ecosystems. Um, and I don't have time to get into the, all the details, but this is made up of many studies that were conducted over many decades. But what I want to tell you is about an emphasis on that issue of many decades. So now I'm stepping back and focusing on all the fragmentation experiments where um, the number of species has been measured for, again, up to decades. And so what I have here is a different measure of effect size, the percent change in species richness. Here's zero, so it's going down from there. And what struck me by assembling these decades-long experiments, um, you can't read this, all this, but this is um, arthropod species. Uh, birds, butterflies, plants, that the direction of response is downward. It's downward over dec decades. It leads to, on average, 50% loss of species within two decades. And the direction is still downwards, even at the longest extent that has been measured in ecological experiments. So this is bad news for effects of fragmentation on, on biological diversity. And this response extends not just to the diversity of species, but also to the function of ecosystems. And so um, here are measures related to nutrient retention and um, forest productivity and others. Again, the direction of response is degrading function over time and continued degradation, even at the length of the longest experiment. And so, <coughs> So I'm going to leave the, um, I'll leave, I think I've, I think I've run out of time, is that right? Yeah. So the, the last thing I will say is that, um, that we now know from experiments that corridors work. They work in the sense that they increase movement for plants across a variety of plants and animals. They increase the diversity of species. So they have effects that extend to the level of conservation that we're hoping for. Um, but then the question is, 
what is the value of these corridors? I can answer this question for the plants and animals that live in fragments, but what is the value of corridors to people? And here, Andy has um, done a great review to understand what the ecological values of corridors might be and is working more intensely on these issues. Um, and so I'll just end, and I'm going to skip across really with a few pictures of the different ways people use corridors to say that if we take um, into account both the effects of corridors on biodiversity that are measured through experiments and ecological studies, and we take into account their value for how people create them, creating them for riparian buffers and greenways and hedgerows and other ways that we find them in our landscapes, if we take into account all those factors, then it will lead to, I think, more connected landscapes and more connected landscapes likely with wider corridors than we initially envisioned. And so with that, I will, um, I will end by thanking my group of collaborators with the corridor experiment um, up on the top row and my lab group on the next row. And I want to thank you all and I'll be happy to answer any questions or have any discussion about fragmentation, connectivity, and corridors. Thank you very much.